Welcome to a special edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Joanne Williams. We're coming to you from the Juneteenth Day celebration. It rained much of the day, and especially during the parade. That may have decreased the number of people who attended, but it didn't dampen their spirit. Happy Juneteenth Day. Happy Juneteenth. 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 Most Americans celebrate July 4th as their Independence Day, but enslaved Africans in the United States were not freed on the day the Declaration of Independence was signed. That freedom came because of and after the end of the Civil War. We'll tell you that story and reflect on what Juneteenth means today. Welcome to the 47th annual Juneteenth celebration happening here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Of course, Juneteenth has been celebrated here in Milwaukee longer than a lot of cities in America. We have one of the longest running celebrations in the U.S., and that is definitely something to be proud of. Give yourselves a hand. We'll share some of the sights and sounds of the celebration, visit the opening ceremony of America's Black Holocaust Museum, and tell you about some upcoming cultural activities you may want to consider. Thomas Jefferson, uh, promised uh, real independence in, in his, uh, in his uh, Declaration of Independence, but he didn't give it to us. And so uh, when I think in terms of America, July 4th, as being my Independence Day, I, uh, I say no. I think of Juneteenth Day, I think of uh, the 13th Amendment as being my Independence Day. That that, that that I can see myself as being a free citizen living in the United States. Juneteenth is possibly the most important holiday in African American history. It is the moment where black southerners in Texas specifically, but black southerners across the South, became fully aware that indeed slavery had been abolished. President Abraham Lincoln drafted the Emancipation Proclamation during the Civil War. It freed slaves in the 11 states that were in rebellion, but did not abolish slavery in the nation. It took effect on January 1st, 1863. But news of that freedom was slow in traveling. With General Lee's surrender on April 9th, 1865, the Civil War ended. Two months later, on June 19th, Union General Gordon Granger told slaves in Texas that they were freed because of the Emancipation Proclamation. But in truth, not all of us were freed in the Emancipation Proclamation. And Lincoln recognized that as late as 1865. So he gave us the 13th Amendment. And, and if you ask me the truth, it's the 13th Amendment that we ought to be celebrating. The Emancipation Amendment itself makes room for slavery of a different variety, which is in many respects sanctioned and controlled by the state. So individual slave owners no longer are the masters of uh, African Americans or former slaves, but the state becomes the, the apparatus where slavery is managed and controlled. The issues that were initiated with emancipation are still with us. We're still battling the, 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 the struggles and the uh, citizenship related challenges associated with that moment of emancipation and reconstruction. In fact, the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s was referred to, referred to as the second reconstruction. Whether we are talking about voting rights, whether we're talking about full-on equal protection, due process, uh, the, those issues that were a part of that moment of emancipation and reconstruction are very much in al alive and with us today. And, it's, and Juneteenth is critical because it really helps to mark the ways in which African Americans are, are committed to actualizing the meanings of freedom. Since its inception, Juneteenth has been a national celebration of history, culture, purpose, community engagement, and fun. It's celebrated throughout Wisconsin, but the biggest celebration has been here in Milwaukee. This is the 45th year. It originated out of Northcott Neighborhood House. Northcott is a multi-purpose community center. That's the mission agency of the United Methodist Church. So in 1971, Northcott was located on 3rd Street, which is now King Drive. And during that time, businesses were moving out of the community, people were leaving the neighborhood, and staff just felt that something needed to happen to bring interest back into our community. 
So we're here with some very special people for Juneteenth Day, Adrian Griffin. Adrian, how long have you been involved in Juneteenth Day? 33 years I've been in NORCA, so 33 years. What do you get out of participating and, and helping to organize this event? The unity, the uh, collaboration with the agencies and sponsors, and it's just be a great day. It's a great day to remember how far we came. If she's been at it for 33 years, how many years have you been participating and organizing? I've only been at it for 43 years <laughs> out of the 47. And it's a day of fellowship, it's a day of unity, where we do it in the Rambe community, which Rambe is a Swahili word that means pulling together, and that's exactly what we need to do. And as we look around today, that's exactly what we're doing. We talked with a number of people who attended the day's events. I'm a professional singer. I do sing around here in Milwaukee. I started when I was 12 years old. Um, I got a chance to sing for Juneteenth uh, several years ago. And I also do Summerfest and Garfield Days. But Juneteenth is so crowded, no matter how cold it is, everybody's here. Some people call this a great big family reunion. What do you think? It is, because I run into people that I went to school with decades ago. And some of them, when they see me, Andrea, you still look the same. You hadn't changed. And I said, well, you hadn't changed either. So it is a reunion. It is. And I love it. This was the first day I went to the parade, though. But I've been to Juneteenth multiple times. I'm from the city of Milwaukee. Love the city of Milwaukee. It's just coming to support black businesses and black people. And just uh, enjoy this day with the community. So what did you think of the parade? Uh, the parade was good. It was raining, but, you know, people still came out and did what they were supposed to do. So uh, I was happy and glad that uh, it continued to go on with the rain. When you talk about Milwaukee to your friends in Michigan, what do you tell them? Really, they don't even know where Milwaukee is a lot of times. <laughs> so uh, basically, I just tell them, they just think of uh, it's farms and cheese here. So I just tell them about the great things and the great people here. I'm actually uh, the community engagement specialist at Milwaukee Jobs Work. So we help people that have been out of work or underemployed from low-income neighborhoods get back into working and building up their self-esteem and life. And so I'm here just representing our organization and I'm also part of the Promise Zones. So the Milwaukee Promise Zones, it's an initiative by Alderman Hamilton started it in the city and it's really an opportunity for some zones where there's been underrepresentation to have community organizations and resources and police assigned to them to really enhance all the necessary assets and services and make communities healthier and cleaner and better places to live. I've been coming to Juneteenth uh, since I was a child, since about five years old with my father. What was that experience like? Um, it was sort of what it is right now. It was a lot of uh, economic opportunities for people to showcase what they're doing, uh, what the business they have, and uh, a lot of togetherness, a lot of, a lot of hugs, a lot of handshakes, a lot of warm greetings. That's what it's been for me over the course of years. Juneteenth is about celebrating uh, black history, celebrating freedom, celebrating resources, and celebrating community. So all of those things are reasons to be here. Is it just for African Americans? No way. It's, uh, again, it's about community, and community is more than African Americans. As the elders sometimes say, this was a good getting up morning. I see all of Milwaukee in the house this morning. We sit here on the footprint of the last manifestation of the museum. This space is the new home of America's Black Holocaust Museum. Its founder, Dr. James Cameron, was the only known survivor of a lynching. Just imagine, if you can, 16-year-old boy arrested and jailed along with two teenagers for a crime that was committed. My father did not participate in it, but the two young men with him were dragged from the jail by thousands of a mob and uh, brutally uh, killed. They were hung, stabbed, beat, whatever you could think of, 16 years old. And my dad sitting in the cell waiting and they came to get him. They drug him, beat him, 
We're getting ready to lynch him also in between his two friends, uh, Abe and, and Tom. But for some reason, my dad said it was divine intervention, and I have to go along with that. He was spared and allowed to stagger back to the jail. Dr. Cameron wrote a book about that experience and created the museum. It opened on Juneteenth in 1988. He spent the rest of his life lecturing on the evils of lynching. He died in 2006, and the museum closed two years later. In 2012, the museum reopened online with the promise of eventually coming back. Last year, plans were announced for the reopening of the museum as part of a development package spearheaded by Melissa Goines of the Mars Group. This year's celebration honored Goines' 12th anniversary as a developer, and it featured actor and human rights activist Danny Glover. Danny was in Alabama for a museum that was put together by Brian Stevenson called Legacy Museum, Slavery to Mass Incarceration. Every state has a governor. The governor of Alabama happened to say, why is this museum necessary? And Danny, I want to know what was your response to that? Baldwin also said, James Baldwin, who I remember reading at 17 years old, The Fire Next Time. It also said when we cannot tell ourselves the truth about our past, we become trapped in it. That's exactly why this museum is important. It's exactly why the continued elevation of memory is important to pass that down from one generation to the next generation to tell the truth, not only the, the truth about slavery, but the truth about First Nation people. We are planning to open the museum in the fall. We made some significant progress on the reopening, but we have a ways to go. We want this to be the community's museum. We you know, want everyone in the community to have some uh, pride and some ownership in this museum. And we're urging everyone in the community to become a member, to donate, to give some time. That is the only way that we're going to have a successful reopening and have a sustainable museum that's going to last well into the future. People have to eat even when it rains. And Juneteenth wouldn't be the same without some down-home cooking. The weather sucks, <laughs> but once you commit to something, you still gotta come out and support, support such a wonderful cause and be a part of something amazing. And how long have you and your family been running the shop? About two years now. And this is our second time being a part of Juneteenth as well. The family business is called Barcode, and it is a bar but they serve food as well. How long have you been catering food? I've been catering food for a very long time, but I'm just now made it into a business and I enjoy, it's something I really enjoy doing. This year, two young ladies were crowned Miss Juneteenth. What does being Miss Juneteenth mean to you? Um, for me, it's being a role model in my community. Um, I'm very involved. I'll be going to college next year, so I need to learn to get involved in college and being involved in my community. And what does it mean, what does being Miss Juneteenth mean for you? Um, Juneteenth Day means to me a special deal because I'm the first to win a pageant in my family, so it's like starting a new trend and being a role model for my sisters. Some young attendees found relief from the weather inside the King Commons Art Gallery. They engaged in drumming, face painting, and arts and crafts. The gallery will be hosting a gallery night and day this month. It's an event the gallery has hosted for the past decade. I started as a volunteer, bringing artists in, looking for artists, finding artists, and everybody was just so, they were so pleased 10 years ago that they had a place where they could show their art. You know, they didn't have to go downtown. So our next upcoming gallery night is July 20th. July 20th and then their gallery day on the 21st. Um, but 5.30 to 9, 9 o'clock, 
on July 20th, Friday, July 20th, uh, we do a citywide gallery night. And our uh, theme is, mercy, mercy me, what about our ecology? Gallery night is one of many events being sponsored this summer that showcase African-American culture and history. The African Cultural Festival is another. The African Cultural uh, Festival started uh, in 1998, uh, which is the foundation of the organization itself, uh, called African Film in Milwaukee. So the African picnic was like the trademark of the organization. Some of the activities that we'll be holding uh, at the event will include um, a fashion show, um, music, lots of uh, drumming and dancing. Um, there's going to be food, but it's going to be vendors. Um, there will be artifacts, clothing, African clothing. Um, there's a soccer match that we play. There's a kids area for kids to play. It is free, but you are supposed to bring a can for the hunger tax box. Every year we highlight one country. So this year is going to be Sudan. We are highlighting Sudan, so it's going to be everything about Sudan, from the food to the culture to the music to their clothing, everything. Fans of the Negro Baseball League, take note. The Brewers' annual tribute is now African American Heritage Night. So African American Heritage Night is a night that the Milwaukee Brewers use to celebrate African American history in baseball. And so it's going to be Friday, August 3rd, and you'll see the Milwaukee Brewers donning their vintage Negro League uniforms. We'll have 10 players from the Negro Leagues that will be there at the game. Um, you'll also have some of them who will be signing autographs. Um, Herbert Walker and uh, Mr. Kirkendall will be honored prior to the game. So it's really just a, a chance to pay tribute to the history of African Americans in baseball. At Aurora, we help people live well and really recreation and being with your family is helping people live well as well. So we're sponsoring it because we believe in that and want to interact with our community, but we also believe in the rich history of baseball. Diversity is important to us as well at Aurora, and, and the history itself is important to point out. Also in August, the much-awaited return of African-American arts and culture to Meyer Park. Black Arts Fest MKE is Saturday, August 4th at the Summerfest grounds, and it's a cultural experience for African and African American heritage. And we are going to have so many activities, um, cultural education for kids, we're going to have music, um, both contemporary and traditional, as well as dance, shopping, food, a marketplace, fine arts, it covers all the different areas. We have MC Light and Tony, Tony, Tony as two of our headliners. And then another earlier headliner is Bobby Rush, who is a well, well-known uh, national blues artist who is just coming off Jazz and Heritage at New Orleans 2018. We're starting in 2018 with a one-day event. We figured bringing it back, keep it manageable, um, just as a learning experience also for us in producing the event. And then we will grow it um, into two and three days and bring it back to a full weekend of celebration. Black Nouveau is on the corner of Center Street and King Drive to celebrate this year's Juneteenth Day celebration. Today's topic is gonna to be social justice. Social justice is a hot topic in America and right here in Milwaukee, especially since the recent body cam footage video release of Milwaukee Bucks guard Sterling Brown. Joining us today to talk about social justice are Jamal Smith, racial justice community engagement manager at the YWCA of Southeast Wisconsin. Sherlyn Moore, Executive Director of Urban Underground and founding member of Youth Justice Milwaukee, and Sean Lowe, Central Regional Vice President of the National Urban League Young Professionals. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having Thank us. You for Thank having you. Us. Let's get started. Uh, Sean, why don't you tell us how did you get involved in uh, social justice and what does your organization do? I initially joined the Milwaukee Urban League Young Professionals locally in 2005 and have been serving ever since in progressive positions. I'm the immediate past president of the local chapter and since becoming central region vice president of the National Urban League Young Professionals, 
I really want to ensure that we continue our mission focusing on leadership development, philanthropy, and volunteerism to the community. Since I know that Milwaukee is in such need, I want to make sure I continue my community service at the national level. Jamal. So uh, as part of the YWCA uh, Southeast Wisconsin team, uh, a lot of our work is centered around uh, facilitating conversations about unlearning racism. How do we get people to really focus on the impact of racism, white privilege, uh, and other concepts that lead to a lot of the oppressive and and uh, the different systemic and institutional uh, practices that we see. I've been doing, uh, or been involved in uh, social justice probably going on nearly 10 years now. And uh, it's to me, it's an obligation. It's something that's required in order to ensure that our community is being afforded the same uh, e equitable opportunities that we know we deserve, not that we should have, but we deserve to have. And until we get the, uh, the, the country and people to realize the importance of that, this fight continues. Charlene? Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So Urban Underground is a social justice organization that works with high school age young people, grades nine through 12. Um, we've been in existence now for about 18 years and we've seen so many changes throughout the city. Um, our current work that we're um, doing with our coalition Youth Justice Milwaukee, which is to um, decriminalize and um, deinstitutionalize young people from being um, shipped off into um, oppressive uh, systems. Um, and so our goal is to close down our youth system, youth prison systems and um, create alternatives. Uh, living in a city such as uh, Milwaukee, where you're working with young people, a lot of them know that there are disparities, that there are differences um, in this city. And so our organization um, really was tasked with, how do we change that? How, do you, how are young people a product of changing their environments? And social justice is just one of those ways that has been, you know, very similar. Jamal is just something that has been ingrained. It's been a passion. Um, and we have to work collectively together in order to change it. Let's stick with you on this. Now, um, social justice involves, you know, organ organizing with other groups in order to get, a, get to a common goal. What other organizations do you organize with? Absolutely, so it's very imperative. We cannot do this work alone. We cannot do it in silo. It is critical that we are partnering with each other. So Urban Underground is a partner, um, has um, partnership with the YWCA. We have part partnerships with the ACLU, along with several other youth organizations and other community um, partners throughout the city that are working towards a common goal. So partnerships are critical. Jamal. So we've, uh, again, to Charlotte's point, working with uh, YWCA, uh, being a part of the Youth Justice uh, Milwaukee Coalition, also with the African American Roundtable, with uh, organizations like Wisconsin Voices and 9 to 5, Metcalf Park, Community Bridges. So the importance there is there's got to be a, a gathered approach to this. You know, it can't be the individual individualized work towards tackling a systemic issue. So. We, we've, we've focused on developing a coalition that is uh, geared towards developing ways to eradicate racism. Sean, how do you get more buy-in from the community? I think you get more buy-in from the community by really expressing the issues to them, letting them know the importance of their voice and especially their vote. We have an election right here in Wisconsin in August. We have a national election in November. We need to make sure everyone is registered to vote. They're engaged with whoever their elected officials are, making sure they're holding them accountable. I was just recently in D.C. doing Capitol Hill visits with our elected officials to ensure that they understand what the National Urban League is doing to make communities stronger. Now, uh, Sean, I'll stick with you on this. How has the Sterling Brown incident, um, has it helped you or hurt your issues as far as social justice is concerned? Anytime a concerning issue like that happens, I would say that um, both. I would say that it hurts us because there's so much negativity towards the police officers and we want to really work with the police officers and work with the community organizations. We really like to come together and alleviate any potential violence like this. So when something like that happens, we move further away from working together and I would say it helps shed light on the dangerous activity that, that is going on. What happens if there's not a cell phone there? What happens if there's not a video camera? And I need other police officers 
to hold bad police officers accountable. But again, the Urban League is about working with the chief of police, the mayor, the local legislators to ensure that something like this truly never happens again. It shouldn't happen in Milwaukee or any city. Jamal, uh, last question. Um, when we talk about social justice, a lot of people think it's being anti-police. Is that true? Absolutely not. Uh, I think when it comes to social justice, it's really just uh, providing or, or lobbying for the opportunity afforded to everyone uh, so that people, regardless of race, creed, sexual orientation, religious background, can still be uh, afforded the opportunities at life. You know, we talk about uh, laissez-faire, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness type issues. Well, everyone should be afforded of that, and there should be nothing that would prohibit someone from doing that. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. Um, this is a great topic. Thank you. Join us for the next edition of Black Nouveau on August 2nd at 9 p.m. on Channel 10. We've invited the three candidates for Milwaukee County Sheriff to tell us why they deserve your vote on August 14th. And remember, you can always find us online and on Facebook. We'll have links to the activities we mentioned on this program and the full Danny Glover interview. And give us a call at 414-797-3760. We'll be glad to hear from you. We hope you've enjoyed this special edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Joanne Williams. Thanks for watching.